kind of know. Okay, good. All right, welcome everyone to the AI seminar. And today we have a distinguished speaker today, uh, Dr. Rostowski. I hope I said it correctly. Uh, he's uh, currently working at IBM Almaden as a research scientist there, and but formerly he was at the uh, University of Mannheim where he recently completed his PhD thesis. Uh, working with Heiko Paulheim, uh, where he was working on data mining stuff. And I became familiar with his work because we actually used some of the, some of the stuff that he did in his thesis in a project that we did here at ISI. So I, it's quite nice. And he was uh, uh, actually selected for the ISWC Distinguished Dissertation Award. So I think that'll be awarded. So congratulations to him on that. Uh, and so I invited him down since I thought he had done a lot of interesting stuff. And it was you know, nice to learn about what he's doing next. So I guess he's going to be talking about some of his current work on applied human loop AIs. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, so uh, I'm working at IBM Research uh, Almaden for a year and a half now, and uh, most of our engagements are around uh, applied human in the loop uh, AI. Uh, so we all know the standard uh, knowledge discovery process. Uh, it consists of uh, uh, five steps. So first we have the data. Uh, we try to do some uh, selection on the data to select the most appropriate data that we want to work. Uh, we do some pre-processing uh, on the data to clean it, normalize, and so on. Uh, then uh, we apply some uh, transformations uh, procedures uh, to transform it in a way that it can be um, accessed and processed by most of the data mining algorithms. We apply some uh, data mining on the data, and uh, then uh, we go to the next step, which is interpretation and uh, evaluation. And then uh, if we are not satisfied with the results, uh, we can go back to any of the steps, uh, try to improve it uh, until we get uh, the, the, the best results we can get. So this, uh, this pipeline was introduced by Fayad et al. in uh, 1996. And uh, the question here is like, how, how good is currently uh, the knowledge discovery um, uh, process? So in the industry, uh, most of the uh, AI actually tops at uh, 80%. And the question is 80% uh, accuracy uh, enough in most of the uh, everyday life tasks uh, that we are trying to solve. So for example, if we go to uh, self-driving cars, 80% is for sure not enough. Uh, accuracy. So for, that's why, uh, because like for example, when the, an accident happens or if the weather is uh, bad, uh, there is a snowstorm and so on, uh, then the AI simply doesn't perform very well. And in these cases, you cannot allow the, the system to make any mistake. Um, another problem that uh, we are uh, actually seeing in uh, AI is uh, actually the subjectiveness that uh, is coming uh, that in many domains and um, uh, applications we have uh, subjectiveness. For example, uh, let's say that we are building a fruit dictionary. <coughs> so we have uh, like, um, for example, banana, uh, banana, pineapple, apple, watermelon. And uh, then we come up uh, with uh, tomato. So if we actually check uh, the definition of uh, tomato, it says uh, that it is actually a fruit or a berry. And then the question is, uh, do we add uh, the tomato in our uh, dictionary? So of course, if you're building like a, a official fruit taxonomy, then we would add it. But for example, if you're building a fruit uh, salad, um, ingredients for fruit salad, uh, then uh, probably we would not like to put uh, tomato there. Another uh, bigger problem with the subjectiveness is uh, that it's coming from the subject matter experts' knowledge and uh, intention. So we know that uh, human annotation tasks actually intrinsically carry a level of uh, disagreement among uh, annotators, regardless of uh, their level of uh, domain expertise. For example, in many medical domain, the, the uh, domains, uh, the annotator's agreement is around 66%, which, of course, if it's 66%, you cannot actually train an uh, effective uh, machine learning model on, uh, on this data set. So, for example, does the adverse drug reaction sensitivity to light uh, belong to the category visual impairment or photophobia? So, for us, it might be... Uh, the same, but uh, actually in the in the in the medical domain, uh, there is like huge difference between these uh, categories. And one uh, doctor could say it it goes in visual impairment, but in the other one, it goes to photophobia. So then uh, the question is like, uh, if the subject matter experts uh, themselves cannot always be sure uh, what they want to achieve uh, and how they want to achieve that, uh, can actually an AI system solve that automatically? So of course the answer is no but at least it can help them to get to their solution more efficiently and uh, effectively. Another problem that uh, we are actually facing currently in the uh, automated AI is uh, the safety, ethics, and uh, bias. So for example, we would like to avoid like um, automatic actions that uh, could lead to catastrophic results, for example, in uh, self-driving cars. Uh, also, because uh, we are working currently on uh, uh, 
migrating uh, data center. So, for example, you wouldn't like uh, to disconnect uh, uh, the production database uh, at, just to move it to the cloud and have it offline for a couple of days just because somebody mislabeled it as um, a client uh, laptop. Um, another point is like, uh, for example, generating creative and cheaper perfumes um, actually seems like an easy job, but uh, apparently you cannot mix some substances because uh, you can uh, make an explosion once uh, the, the substance actually touches human skin, uh, because we are also working with um, uh, perfume uh, designers. Um, another problem is that uh, we have to maintain uh, human values uh, and morals. Uh, so, for example, AI uh, could actually introduce some uh, gender, racial, uh, and uh, national uh, discrimination, which we would like to avoid, and uh, the AI cannot actually uh, do it automatically. So that's why we have to have uh, human in the loop. And uh, in many applications, actually, it's still required that uh, uh, the, the, the human approval is uh, legally uh, required. For example, all medical domains require that uh, the human is always going to actually uh, have the final word and uh, the action is going to be uh, taken by, by the human. So that's why uh, we would like to introduce uh, the human in the loop uh, AI, where the human is involved in each step of the knowledge discovery process. So instead of uh, trying to optimize uh, each step of the pipeline, we are trying to involve in a nice way the human in each of these steps. So we are trying to get uh, the feedback from the human and uh, how to uh, make uh, the, the human's life easier by uh, developing approaches uh, that are going to allow this in the, the most easiest way. Uh, so as uh, one famous saying is saying, uh, computers are incredibly fast, accurate and stupid. Uh, but human beings are incredibly slow, inaccurate, and brilliant. So if we actually merge them together, uh, they are powerful uh, beyond uh, imagination. So the, the general idea is to apply the Pareto's 80-20 rule, where we have 80% uh, machine input, where the machine is going to do most of the work, and for everything that is tricky, we are going to ask for uh, human input, which is around 20% in general. Uh, so in today's talk, I would like uh, to introduce uh, to to present you a couple of uh, real world applications that uh, I work in uh, IBM on with uh, real clients. Uh, so the first uh, general direction is uh, knowledge extraction, where we work on uh, dictionary expansion, ontology population, and um, uh, building personalized knowledge graphs uh, for the pharmaceutical domain. Uh, another application is. Um, data center understanding because uh, IBM is trying to, to help all clients uh, to move their data centers to the cloud. So before you move it to the cloud, you have to understand uh, what is happening in the data center in case uh, you break something. Uh, the third application is uh, AI for material discovery, uh, where we work with the material discovery team in IBM uh, to develop uh, new polymers, uh, which are used in all kinds of products, uh, for example, in um, developing new chips. Uh, another application is uh, cognitive horizon surveillance, uh, but I had to take it out of the presentation because the patent is still pending, so I couldn't actually reveal too much about it. And the fifth one is the computational uh, creativity, where we work uh, with uh, McCormick, uh, which is uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, spice producers in uh, USA, and uh, Seamrace, which is one of the biggest uh, perfume, per perfume producers, uh, to actually uh, generate uh, new creative uh, formulas. So I'm going to start with uh, knowledge extraction. Um, so uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the interesting problems is actually that uh, whenever we get a new client, they, they are expecting to get some uh, new insights about their data like instantly. So of course, for example, uh, uh, there is like a question from an auto insurance uh, company, like why our clients are actually canceling uh, all the insurance policies in the last month. And of course, if you take like a couple of weeks, you can develop the perfect approach and then uh, you can expose uh, find all possible analyses, uh, come up with explanations. But if you actually want to give them an answer like right away in 15 minutes, then the easiest way is actually to do some uh, keyword search. So of course, if you have a dictionary of uh, that could be built with the SME who, is, uh, who knows the domain, then in 15 minutes you can actually build a dictionary and then you can uh, make simple analysis uh, to, to actually come up with um, some of the ideas what, what was happening in the, in the past uh, couple of months in the, in the company. Uh, so we know that dictionaries and ontologies are also the backbone of uh, many applications in NLP, information retrieval, uh, recommender system, and so on. Uh, and they're used to organize the data and uh, automate particular tasks. Uh, however, maintaining them and uh, expanding them is not uh, trivial because a large amount of uh, new content is generated uh, over short periods of time, and also the trend of expansion is uh, sub subject to change. 
Uh, and also, as I said before, uh, the dictionary mem membership is actually a subjective task. It's based on the domain and uh, based on the subject uh, matter experts. So one of the <clears throat> domains that we work is uh, in the pharmaceutical domain, uh, where most of the pharma uh, companies are actually trying to identify adverse drug reactions that are reported in social media or uh, patient blogs. Uh, so just to avoid some uh, big uh, lawsuits. Uh, and for that, so they have like a group of uh, medical uh, practitioners who are going through these uh, blogs and social media, and they're literally reading the whole content and actually to identify some um, uh, adverse drug reactions. For example, upper stomach pain, uh, higher blood pressure, abnormal clotting, and so on. Uh, then they extract all these um, uh, phrases, all these uh, entries, and then uh, this can be used actually to automate the task uh, in the future where this is going to be used actually for searching in any new content that appears in social media or um, any blogs. Uh, the problem is then that uh, there are a lot of missing entries, so this cannot be fully automatic. For example, in the dictionary, you could have uh, upper stomach pain, but uh, in the co in the text uh, appears lower stomach pain or acute lower uh, stomach pain or acute lower knee pain. So uh, that's why we propose a solution, a human in the loop uh, solution. <laughs> Uh, which employs a neural language model uh, coupled with tight uh, human in the loop uh, supervision to assist the user in building and maintaining a domain specific dictionary from an input uh, text corpus. So, the interesting part here is that it's uh, uh, feature independent. So, besides tokenization, the approach does not require any feature engineering or any NLP pre processing or post tagging and so on. Uh, it involves uh, human in the loop uh, to avoid um, semantic drift at every cycle and uh, uh, it's also interesting that it's uh, future proof uh, because it's able to identify phrases that do not actually appear in the current text, but they might appear in future text, uh, and uh, this reduces how frequently a human needs to tune up the, the dictionary. Uh, so, on the input of the algorithm, uh, we have um, input text corpus and a small set of uh, seed examples, which can be provided uh, by the subject matter expert. Then we built a neural language model, so a simple word to vec or, for example, a long short term memory uh, neural net. Um, and then the algorithm uh, runs in two, uh, in two steps. First is the explore uh, phase, which is trying to identify semantically similar uh, instances to the seed instances. And then there is exploit, which is trying to come up with more complex uh, and more creative uh, instances that would appear in, the, in, in future texts. Uh, after each iteration, the, the results are presented to the user, and then the user um, accepts or rejects them, and then it goes to the uh, next, next iteration. The process stops uh, once the user is satisfied with the results, or there is no more data to be uh, extracted. So, as I said, the explore phase is uh, quite simple. It simply looks for uh, semantically similar um, instances. So for that, you can uh, simply use, uh, for example, cos and similarity between the embedding vectors of uh, the instances in the input uh, seed and uh, all the instances that are uh, presented into the text corpus. So, these are being sorted and presented to the user. Uh, and this, uh, for example, some some examples are like if you have tiredness as a seat uh, example, then uh, you will come up with fatigue, or if you have angry, you would come up with uh, frustrated, and all this is going to be added into the dictionary. Uh, so the exploit phase is more interesting uh, because it's trying to construct more complex multi-term uh, phrases based on the instances already um, explored. Uh, so we have uh, exploit phase based on uh, word to vec uh, and uh, exploit, which is based on uh, uh, bidirectional LSTMs, uh, which is going in two directions, forward and uh, backward expansion. So when we are using uh, word to vec uh, in the first stage, we are trying to modify the phrase by uh, replacing terms uh, with similar terms. So first we break uh, the input uh, phrase into tokens, and then for each token, we are trying to simply replace it uh, with a semantically similar uh, term. So for example, if you have abnormal behavior, you can simply replace abnormal with strange or you can maybe replace behavior with attitude, and then uh, maybe in the second iteration, you can uh, uh, replace both of them, and then you can have a uh, strange attitude. So you see that uh, uh, starting from one seat, uh, you can generate uh, three, three new seats, and not necessarily all of them uh, need to be into the text corpus. Uh, in the second step of, of the same algorithm, what we are trying to do is like uh, to extend the phrase with um, terms uh, that appear in the same context. 
So for that, uh, we are simply um, using the probability that uh, given one word, uh, what is the probability that another word would appear uh, right next to it? So for example, in the case of word to we can use uh, simply uh, the softmax function. And uh, for example, if we have uh, clotting problems on the input, and uh, we can observe that also uh, in the text corpus we have uh, blood clotting, then we can generate uh, the, the phrase blood uh, clotting uh, problems, or uh, we can even go further, for example, abnormal blood, which, can, which could be uh, pressure and uh, cell count, which would result into abnormal blood clotting problems. So we see we are starting from, uh, from um, a phrase with uh, two tokens, and we end up with a uh, phrase with four tokens after two iterations, which is completely valid. Or, for example, we can come up with, uh, if we have stomach pain into the dictionary, uh, we can observe that uh, also we have upper knee pain, and we know that knee pain and stomach pain are quite similar, then probably there should also be upper stomach pain. And this can also go further like uh, acute upper stomach pain. And this is completely done automatically, even though we don't know uh, what is here, an adjective, noun, verb, and uh, so on. Uh, in the second uh, approach, we use uh, bidirectional LSTMs, uh, so uh, they are commonly used for uh, text generation, and uh, they take as, a uh, as an input a sequence of words, and they are able to predict what would be the next uh, word in the sequence. Uh, so the bidirectional LSTM uh, propagates the, um, the signals uh, forward and uh, backward in time, and um, to use it in our uh, phrase generation algorithm, uh, again, we break the, the input phrase into a set of tokens, and uh, we generate sequences um, into range from uh, 1 to n, and then we feed each uh, sequence into the last layer of the network to get uh, new predictions. In the backward expansion, we do the other way around, so we break again the, the, input, uh, uh, the input phrase, uh, and then we go uh, in reverse to extend it, uh, which usually gets uh, to uh, changing the modifier of uh, the nouns. So for example, if we have on the input uh, high blood pressure, uh, we will generate the sequences uh, high, high blood, and uh, blood, and then we feed this into the um, LSTM, and then we could get uh, some phrases like uh, high blood count, high blood cell, and uh, if we continue with the iterations, we will get something like high blood cell count or high uh, white blood cell count. Uh, if we go uh, backwards, again, we break the, the, the sequence into, um, into the subsequences, and uh, we feed it into the neural network in a backward uh, manner, and then uh, uh, we are just going to reverse it. So, for example, the backward sequence uh, pressure blood is going to be extended with pressure blood low, which if we re reverse it is going to be low blood pressure. And so, for example, here we just added low, and this, is can be, uh, this can be high and so on, uh, which as humans it's quite easy to come up with uh, because we know it's uh, just an adjective, but this is done completely in unsupervised manner. So the human just needs to accept this and uh, we move forward. And of course, this is going to work in any, um, any domain and any text corpus without any, tokenis uh, without any uh, feature extraction or NLP um, uh, pre-processing. Can I ask one question? Doctor? Yes. Uh, so in, in that last approach, you have a significant chance to have a real blow up, you know, in, in the variance that you get. Um, we've done something somewhat similar in, you know, in lists for, you know, say, job titles. And they're sort of a similar, you get manager, assistant manager, supervising assistant manager, and so on. So you can sort of combine these in arbitrary ways. And, and that at some point sort of runs counter the human in the loop because there's then comes a lot of stuff that you know, the human has to either accept and reject. And so have you thought, you know, some of that could actually be easily handled with parsing, where you say, well, this is just another you know, adjective on you know, general manager or a particular disease, as opposed to sort of compiling that out into all possible variants that you might find in a real text. Oh, well, uh, the, the, the point here is that uh, we have like a very simple and uh, intuitive uh, UI that the user can use, and then uh, it just takes like a couple of seconds to review like uh, even hundreds of, um, of instances. So, for example, you're just uh, looking through, and then uh, you just say, "Okay, all of these are accepted," and then it just takes you a couple of seconds. And uh, uh, saying, so, it's not necessarily just hundreds; there might be thousands that you're generating, or more than that, you know, because it really can blow up. Again, as I said, so we are uh, requesting the approval from the human in each step, so we cannot accept anything into the dictionary that the human would not like to. So, the point is like how to actually generate uh, all possible variants at the fastest way and. Uh, how uh, what would be the fastest way for the human to accept them? 
because as I, as we said, like uh, we want the human to be in complete control of uh, what is going into the data. So of course, uh, uh, we know that, for example, all these are going to have confidence almost one. So we know that they're all going to be accepted, but uh, we wouldn't directly put them into the dictionary. Yes. Uh, could you just explain what you're going to do with those dictionaries? How are they used? Yeah, so for example, um, I will come to the end for the, the use cases I, I can explain there. Uh, one question I have is, uh, to what degree do people have too much trust in AI and just simply uh, uh, accept it regardless? That sort of removes the importance of the human in the loop. Um, you know, you might find that a uh, black box algorithm says that this is correct, and you might trust the black box algorithm because it's most of the time correct. But if you were to actually have been given this uh, from a human, you might have been more careful and found that there are certain errors or problems that crop up. Um, so, so you know, I, I just wonder, is, is, is the, the methodology able to account for people being so too trustworthy? Well, our experience is actually that the people are not trustworthy with AI at all. And that, for example, uh, especially when you work with uh, medical practitioners or um, chemists and uh, other subject matter experts, they actually don't trust AI at all. So they are going carefully uh, to, to carefully uh, investigate all possible examples. Even though like the confidences can be like uh, close to one, they would still not uh, blindly trust it. And of course, uh, most of the, um, the influence here comes how the, the results are presented to the user. And in most of the cases, they wouldn't be even um, uh, aware that such cases uh, could exist, but if they are presented to them in the, the nice way, then uh, they, they they, they get to start uh, like uh, to trust uh, the AI and but still they would go through each one example. So it looks like in a sense you are trading here precision for recall. So the output is a very precise list of terms uh, yep. which the user really does not understand. What are all the other terms that would be very relevant that you know I haven't seen them approved before? Yeah, of course, the recall we cannot uh, encounter here for the recall because uh, usually we work like with uh, huge text corpora because then it's impossible to actually always uh, count the recall there. And as I said, like uh, the most of the use cases here is like for quick analysis of uh, huge text corpora. For example, if you want to know like why uh, like thousands of uh, users actually canceled the um, uh, auto policy in the last month, uh, then you could uh, actually uh, start building uh, some of these dictionaries and then uh, you can analyze the context around them. So for example, uh, we found out that um, uh, the biggest reason for canceling the auto policy was uh, that the payment didn't go through. So even if the user wanted to continue the auto policy, there was some problem with the system that actually canceled their uh, automatic payment and then they were like, uh, the, the, the policy was uh, canceled afterwards. And this could be like identified uh, quite fast uh, if you have such dictionary. But also if you had the model, because you could run the model on the text and it would give you roughly the same. Yeah, but uh, to, to actually build the model, you have to have a human who is going to label enough instances and then uh, to train the model and validate the model. And here, because anyways, the human is like uh, looking through the text, uh, building the dictionary, it's like uh, super fast. And then uh, you can just present the results to the user and then the user can uh, see why, what led to these uh, cancellation policies. Okay, we should continue your talk. Uh, so yeah, so we have, we evaluated this on um, uh, how the, on dictionary growth, so or number of newly discovered entries per iteration, and uh, generating uh, future-proof uh, dictionaries, uh, so or identifying uh, relevant unseen instances in the text corpus. So for datasets here, we use uh, identifying adverse rock events into user in uh, user-generated uh, data. Uh, so we collected 1.4 million user reports from ASCA patients, where actually patients uh, report uh, what, will, what were the effects after they took some uh, new drugs. And uh, actually this, uh, this block is quite useful for the um, uh, pharma industry. And uh, the adjudication of uh, this dictionary was performed by a medical doctor. Another data set was the Twitter food, which is a dictionary of uh, food items um, extracted from Twitter. Uh, it contains 4.2 million tweets from January 2017. And uh, also our approach has been um, 
uh, integrated into the IBM call center because IBM offers uh, call centers for um, uh, various uh, companies uh, where users can uh, report uh, various problems or can get uh, support. And there are around uh, 60 uh, different categories of, uh, of the calls, usually like, uh, for example, people are complaining about the product or the helpfulness of the, the person who was on the phone and uh, all possible other, other things. Or sometimes they even call to say that uh, something was working very nice, uh, so they're very satisfied. So here we did uh, the evaluation on uh, customer satisfaction, uh, confusion, ad, uh, and bad uh, connection. Uh, so for the dictionary growth, uh, we count the number of uh, newly discovered dictionaries, uh, dictionary entries uh, per iterations. So as a baseline, we ran uh, simply word to back, uh, which anyways we used into the exploration phase. And uh, for the exploit phase, uh, we run also word to back uh, with 10 candidates and uh, by LSTM uh, with 10 candidates. And then in the end, uh, we measure the accuracy and the average length per iteration. Uh, so in uh, all the data sets, uh, pretty much uh, the um, uh, exp exp um, explore and exploit uh, with word to uh, outperforms uh, the others, uh, except for the um, uh, confusing uh, data set uh, where we identified that actually the phrases can tend to get uh, very long uh, because that's the way that uh, the users are actually reporting uh, confusion on the phone. And uh, we can see that also with uh, the LSTM, we can get actually quite long uh, phrases. Uh, the other interesting evaluation was um, actually generating uh, future-proof dictionaries, for which we took uh, for each of the data sets only 10% uh, of the data set. We trained the model, and then we tried to generate the vocabularies, and then we counted how many of uh, the instances that are not present in these 10% are actually present in the rest of the uh, text, or the 90%. So, for example, for the um, satisfied data set, uh, we ran 20 iterations. We identified uh, 94 um, entries, and uh, 55 of them actually appeared uh, in, the, in the unseen text. So that means that uh, we generate uh, instances that were not present in the current text, but they are present into the future text. So for all of the data sets, uh, it's around, uh, the, the future hit rate is around uh, 50%. And uh, this is quite important because uh, this means that uh, the, the subject matter actually that uh, expert doesn't have to uh, tune up the dictionary all the time. Uh, so where is this actually used? Uh, this is used in, uh, to maintain health and medical uh, data. So for example, we use it in uh, drug package inserts annotations. Uh, it's used in uh, radiology image captioning. Uh, because, uh, for example, uh, we have a team of doctors uh, who are actually looking at um, uh, MRI scans, and there, there is also some labeling uh, given by doctors and then have to come up with uh, a single captioning of uh, this image. It's also used for drug brands and uh, name discovery. Um, it was, in, uh, it was um, uh, integrated into IBM Watson uh, crawling system. Uh, for example, in this crawling system, you give a couple of keywords, but in many cases, of course, if you give like uh, two, three keywords, uh, the coverage is going to be very low. So we use this approach to extend um, uh, the, the set of keywords, and uh, then we would get like uh, more uh, coverage in the, in the, in the crawl. Uh, we also use it for uh, literature horizon scanning in food safety and en energy storage. Um, for example, uh, for query expansion. So, for example, um, if you're looking for, um, I don't know, uh, there, there was also one query, like, for example, novel proteins. And, for example, if you only look for novel proteins, uh, then you get, like, maybe two, three papers uh, per day. But uh, with our approach, we, could, we were able to uh, extract this to something like uh, cricket food or um, fried crickets and uh, all these other additional possible uh, things that actually are novel proteins, and then you get uh, much higher coverage. As I said, we also use it uh, with uh, several of our clients, for example, for auto insurance and uh, GDPR contract uh, analysis. And we also use this approach um, for the ISWC challenge uh, last year, uh, and uh, we actually won the challenge, which was for large-scale uh, relation extraction from web documents and uh, knowledge graphs with uh, human in the loop. So the task was uh, to identify um, supplier-client relationships uh, between um, uh, various companies. So there were a couple of million companies, and the, the data was coming from the web. 
and uh, we had like a couple of billions uh, web pages and then the problem was actually how to identify these relations so we had a couple of um, human in the loop who were actually trying to identify some of these relations and uh, what would be the the fastest way uh, to extract the to extend the dictionary of possible relations between the um, uh, between the companies which actually afterwards we built a model around it and then uh, we got uh, the best results uh, so the second step is actually once we have uh, uh, the dictionaries is how to actually map them to some existing on uh, ontologies. So as I said, uh, from each uh, corpus uh, we extract uh, different type of entities. And then um, of course if we want to actually uh, build uh, interesting applications around it, we have to connect them to some uh, external ontologies or to the linked open data cloud and uh, so on. So usually what's happening is that the subject matter expert is uh, generating some user centric entity grouping. Uh, so they have some um, idea how the entities are grouped to each other. Uh, but then the point is how to actually automatically uh, link them to some uh, existing ontologies and how to maybe uh, give more information to the subject matter expert from uh, external ontologies. Uh, so, for example, uh, here again, we are working with um, adverse drug uh, reactions. So we have some um, uh, text uh, from the ASCA patient blog. And uh, using uh, the previous approach, we are able to extract a bunch of, uh, bunch of um, entities. And then uh, the subject matter expert knows how to actually group them. So, for example, here we have uh, different uh, types of adverse drug reactions for stomach discomfort and uh, for uh, confusion. Uh, so and then the task is how to actually uh, link uh, each of these groups uh, to some existing ontology. So here, for example, we have Medra and this is uh, stomach discomfort and uh, it is linked to abdominal dis distension in uh, the Medra ontology. Uh, so why do we have uh, here human in the loop? Because as I said first, uh, this can be a very uh, subjective task. And uh, for example, some of uh, the decisions are not um, uh, quite easy because um, uh, looking from outside, uh, like at least for me, uh, like uh, looking in ontology, there are so many similar uh, concepts that it's very difficult to actually judge where the where the instances are actually supposed to be mapped. So, for example, for stomach bloating, uh, the algorithm is like uh, quite confident in the beginning, like uh, but once we start moving uh, uh, lower in the hierarchy of the ontology, then it's becoming very difficult to actually annotate. For example, for the final leaf where this uh, instance should be going, and that's why the algorithm is actually uh, deciding to ask uh, the, the subject matter expert only when the confidence is very low, where is this um, instance supposed to be going? And then the human can uh, make the decision that this is going to abdominal uh, distension, for example. Uh, so the general approach here is that um, we have um, on the input uh, text corpus on which we uh, perform entity extraction, uh, then which are uh, somehow categorized uh, based on the user's conceptualization. Uh, we scout for uh, available ontologies in the linked open uh, data cloud. For example, for most of the medical domains, we use uh, the BioPortal. Uh, we select a couple of ontologies, uh, which are there uh, then aligned with the user conceptualization, and then they're used to maintain the knowledge uh, of the user. Uh, so for this, uh, we use a couple of um, a couple of models. Uh, we use a flat uh, flat hierarchical classification top-down local classifier per parent node, and uh, then we combine also uh, both of these approaches. And as classifiers, we use SVM, random forest, logistic regression, and uh, convolutional neural nets. So the uh, flat hierarchical model is quite simple because in each uh, level of the hierarchy of, of the ontology, it tries to uh, build a model uh, where the possible classes are all the nodes on the same uh, level. So this is a very simple approach, um, but as we are moving down the hierarchy, uh, the complexity rises and then uh, the, usually the results for the lowest level of the hierarchy is actually uh, quite poor. Uh, uh, that's why uh, the second approach is the top-down local classifier per part node, which is building a classifier for each node uh, into, the, into the hierarchy. So uh, the classes of uh, the model are going to be simply the, the, the children of uh, each parent in the hierarchy. This is also a very simple approach, uh, but uh, uh, the problem is that uh, there is error pro propagation through the levels. So for example, if you make a mistake uh, at the second level, then you know that uh, the mistake is going to be propagated uh, through the bottom of the hierarchy. So uh, that's why it's not very um, nice model to use in real applications. So in our approach, we actually combine both. So we are trying to build um, flat hierarchical models uh, 
to the lowest level possible in the um, um, in the in the ontology uh, with the highest level uh, with the highest level of confidence. And then once we see that the the confidence is dropping, then we are building uh, uh, top down uh, local classifier per par node. So for example, for for the level L minus one, we built um, a flat model, and then for the level L, we are going to build uh, the uh, local classifier per par node. And this is combining both advantages, uh, the advantages of both models and uh, discards the advantages. And also we can use uh, these models uh, to uh, maintain the knowledge. So for example, whenever a new instance appears, we can simply use uh, the classifier to add, uh, to add it to the right concept. We can also use it for reassigning instances because as uh, the time passes, uh, the conceptualization of the user changes. And then uh, we could realize that actually for some of the instances that are already uh, assigned to some of the concepts, maybe a better concept appeared that, and then this instance has to be moved uh, to the different concept. Uh, also, we are able to generate uh, new concepts. For example, when uh, some concept becomes uh, too big or uh, most of the instances actually, um, the confidence is for being assigned to the same concept, um, the, the distribution is uh, quite uniform and uh, unprecise, then we are uh, suggesting to the user to generate a new concept. And with the same concept, we can actually uh, uh, try to merge concepts and uh, to split them into uh, different uh, more refined um, uh, concepts. Uh, so both of these approach. Yes. One thing that I wasn't clear about. So when you align this user conceptualization with the ontology, the user conceptualization is basically text strings that are grouped in yes. categories. And so where are the text, you know, strings coming that sort of map to ontology concepts? I think you said somewhere that there's sort of instances in text, but I wasn't really clear where, you know. Uh, so, for example, uh, here we have uh, the user conceptualization is the stomach discomfort because uh, simply the, the medical doctor thought that uh, okay, stomach discomfort is uh, the best describing for all these instances. So these are all adverse re reactions that are describing uh, some stomach discomfort. And then in this case, we are trying to align them uh, with uh, Medra. So Medra has like uh, four levels and then the last uh, level, uh, the fifth level is actually the instances. Uh, which the instances are uh, pretty much uh, medically uh, like uh, adverse drug reactions described by uh, medical professionals. But they are like completely different from what uh, patients are reporting. So for example, patients could report uh, tummy ache, but uh, in Medra you only have like, for example, stomach ache. Or for example, there was one instance where a patient reported uh, monsters came out of the ceiling fan because they took some uh, heavy drugs or something so like that's that. That's just a sort of a text string associated with the concept. It doesn't point, say, to instances in the literature where it's saying this particular no. mention is an instance of that concept. No, no. So that's why the, the purpose here is how to actually uh, use um, whatever the, the subject matter expert has extracted and how to actually link it to um, any target ontology. And then, of course, you're using the text from both sides to uh, try to link it up the, in the best way. But here, the problem is actually how low you can go into the hierarchy uh, without uh, using the human. And then once the model gets uh, starts to get confused, uh, then you are asking the, the human in the loop uh, to actually uh, make the decision for you. Uh, so both of these approaches are actually uh, integrated in um, in a tool. So recently, um, IBM acquired uh, one company for extracting um, uh, uh, knowledge from uh, the pharmaceutical domain, which is exposed in a, as a knowledge graph, and this is used across uh, many hospitals um, in uh, USA. For example, uh, the doctors can actually search. Okay, um, I gave to the uh, to the patients um, aspirin. Uh, am I also supposed to give him ibuprofen? Or maybe there is going to be some uh, drug drug interaction there. Or um, if I know that he has these symptoms, what should I uh, give them? And this is coming from a uh, knowledge graph, which is extracted uh, from a set of um, uh, package inserts. So the drug package inserts are those like uh, huge um, papers that are coming uh, whenever you buy a drug, uh, then you get like um, maybe sometimes even 20, 30 pages of um, instructions where it's listed like uh, what are the symptoms that you can take the drug for, uh, what could be the adverse drug reactions, and uh, what would happen if this is given to a pregnant woman and uh, so on. And they usually come into, uh, um, like they're also published uh, online. So the FDA uh, requires that each uh, pharmaceutical company publishes this uh, document uh, annually. And whenever there is an update, it has to be uh, re-uploaded. 
So um, there is a group of uh, medical experts who are actually going through these uh, pamphlets and then they're like manually would go and extract all interesting information. So all the symptoms, uh, the, um, uh, how, how it's supposed to be used, uh, what would be the adverse drug reactions and um, uh, interactions with um, other drugs. And this is being uh, populated into a graph. So we try to actually uh, reduce the time that uh, the, um, the subject matter experts are going through this uh, process of uh, reading the whole document. So the simplest thing is actually to recognize the main entities that are inside and the relations among them. So the problem was actually how to quickly obtain uh, the training data for training any of the models. And because again, as we said, uh, this is quite subjective and uh, actually there are a couple of teams that are working for this. So for example, some of them are only working for uh, extracting adverse drug reactions. Some of them are only working for extracting, um, for example, uh, the, the usage and uh, how, make, how, many, uh, how much of the drug should be taken and uh, so on. And uh, the, one of the biggest problem is that all the analysis must be done uh, into the PDFs that they're looking at because uh, they are following uh, usually some, um, uh, some, some structure that uh, the medical experts are actually used to and they wouldn't like uh, to actually just uh, look at uh, some other tool uh, which is trying to extract but everything has to be annotated inside the document and then they have to make the decisions inside the document. So for example, one of the biggest problem is actually uh, analyzing the table. So even though there is so much research on tables, we are still not able to completely understand and uh, uh, parse uh, tables. So for example, this is a table which is uh, explaining something about the first uh, reactions and we can see that uh, there's a couple of uh, titles, subtitles, and uh, you have to know how the, uh, how the drugs actually are related to, to each other here. And uh, also, as I, as I mentioned, because these uh, documents continuously update, uh, sometimes uh, even monthly. Uh, so the problem is that you have to identify these uh, changes regularly and um, uh, extract them and populate them correctly into the graph. So in our approach, uh, what we are doing is uh, we have a human in the loop strategy to extract entities, relations, and uh, textual annotations. So for the entities, we use uh, simply the dictionary expansion approach. Uh, for relations, we use uh, state-of-the-art uh, relation extraction between the entities that we already discovered. And textual annotations uh, can be any sentences or paragraphs for which we use uh, standard uh, text classification models. Uh, also, we have to be able to handle diverse input data. For example, most of the documents, as I said, come into PDFs, but some of them are also like image PDFs, which are just simply scanned PDFs, and uh, it's quite difficult to understand them. And some of those documents are actually simple text documents or web pages or Word documents or Excel documents. So we have to be able to, do, to handle diverse input data. And uh, as I said, we have to maintain uh, uh, the knowledge resources uh, to be up to date because uh, these um, package inserts are changing uh, quite often. So the approach is that um, uh, in the beginning we have uh, the SMEs working with the documents as they usually do, and then as they are trying to, as they are labeling uh, data in, directly into the PDF, which is connected uh, uh, to an additional tool which is directly populating uh, the knowledge graph, uh, we are trying to uh, uh, use this information to train entity relation and textual annotations models, and uh, then uh, on the next documents we are applying these models and then we are uh, pre-labeling the documents for them. And now instead of uh, reading all possible parts of the document, the subject matter experts can go through whatever it's labeled and that they can uh, adjudicate and accept or reject uh, the proposed uh, labels. And at, at, at any time they can actually add additional labels as uh, they wish. Uh, so again, uh, with such a system, the subject matter ex experts have full control of what types of semantic annotations are going to be identified. Uh, and again, they can decide on what is considered acceptable accuracy performance. Uh, so if they want to read the whole document, they can still read the whole document and achieve 100% accuracy. And so the system simply assists the user to improve the efficiency in, in identifying the semantic annotations and uh, to reduce the, the human error. So as we said, uh, we are able to handle diverse input data and uh, we maintain uh, uh, the knowledge to be up to date uh, by identifying uh, what were the changes, additions, deletions and uh, relocations uh, over time. 
so for the um, uh, because we had to evaluate our approach on some uh, publicly available data, so we uh, decided to go with uh, six uh, types of entities: uh, symptoms, dosage, frequency, body part, root, uh, and clinicians, for which we use our previous uh, approach for extending. Uh, we use also additional ontologies um, from BioPortal. There are 764, and then we are trying to map uh, the extracted uh, dictionaries uh, to some of these um, uh, concepts from the ontologies. Uh, we extract drug-to-drug uh, -drug interactions and um, adverse drug uh, events relations. Uh, for that, we use uh, CNN, uh, convolutional neural networks, and uh, we also uh, extract textual annotations like adverse drug events uh, sentences and uh, usage uh, sentences where it's explained how uh, precisely to use the, the drug. Yes. Do you know any sort of conflict resolution when uh, you know users are annotating? Get some conflicting information? Uh, so this is all going to be uh, stored in a graph and uh, it's all like uh, locked because as I said, there can be bias and uh, we are not going to try to solve the bias for the doctors because the doctors have to solve um, uh, the conflicts uh, themselves. So we are simply storing everything in the knowledge and then uh, this is exposed to them uh, to be solved by them. So if we, we run afterwards like a validation of the knowledge graph for inconsistency. So of course, if you annotate um, the same um, word as uh, being uh, part of uh, different ontologies or part of different concepts, uh, then this is going to be presented to the users that cannot go for further, that somebody has to solve it. But we are not going to try to tell them which part it needs to be, because if two doctors disagree, uh, who are we to tell them uh, what which one is correct? So then do you suggest them both? Like so they. This is going to be uh, to the manager. This is going to be presented to the manager, and then the manager has to solve it, like on local level between them. Uh, so for the relation classification, we use uh, um, state-of-the-art convolutional deep neural network. I'm not going to go into details, but uh, it uh, accepts like a sentence uh, with uh, extracted uh, entities inside, and then it's trying to see if um, there is a relation between those uh, two entities. Uh, so the final knowledge graph uh, look, looks like something like this. Uh, so we uh, maintain uh, unique identifiers for all the drugs. And then for all the drugs, uh, we have different versions of the documents. So for example, this is one drug, uh, Xparel, for which we have already 16 uh, versions. And then for each version, we completely disassemble the, the PDF document uh, into tokens. And then for each token, we preserve the coordinates into the PDF document, which allows us to uh, be able to recompile the document uh, as it's coming from and um, with the additional semantic uh, labels. Then each token here, it's uh, uh, connected uh, to the ontology and to the um, uh, internal uh, dictionaries. And then we can see that also there are relations between uh, the um, uh, drugs um, in the knowledge graph. For example, there is a uh, drug interaction between Xperil and this beta DIN. And then all this data is also stored in the MongoDB, uh, which allows uh, the users to actually uh, quickly search uh, through all the documents and um, uh, perform many additional tasks. Uh, so for the demo purposes, uh, this was also integrated in uh, Adobe Reader. Uh, where we actually add layers on the PDF. So we uh, preserve the original PDF and then we simply add uh, uh, syntactic and semantic uh, extractor, extractors. Uh, so for example, uh, for the syntactic, we can uh, track all the changes or what was added or what was deleted from the previous version. So for example, the orange one is telling you that uh, this word was not existing there in the previous version. And then the yellow is saying, okay, this uh, trigger, for example, existed, but uh, it was slightly changed from the previous version. And uh, there is also here a gray uh, comment box, which is telling you in the previous version, there was another word here, but now it uh, it is deleted. And this is very important because uh, this is quite easy to identify some uh, crucial changes. For example, if additional adverse drug reaction was identified, then um, the doctors should like be identified right away that uh, this was there. And of course, then uh, we add all the ontological annotations. For example, here it's uh, Medra. Then we have uh, all the internal uh, lexicons that we have, for example, for drugs. And uh, for example, in uh, green, we have uh, the um, text classification, which here is telling us that uh, this whole paragraph is about uh, reporting adverse drug events. Okay. Okay, <laughs> that was fast. Um, 
So the, the next application is uh, knowledge graphs and AI for uh, data center understanding. Um, but I would actually skip and I would go to the AI for material discovery because that's much more interesting. Okay, so um, IBM is actually working with um, uh, material discoveries. Uh, so they're generating uh, new polymers, um, um, which are can be requested by uh, different clients. For example, uh, we develop um, uh, chips in IBM, and then uh, of course uh, there is a request for different polymer every year, which is going to be better uh, performance and so on. Uh, so it often takes like uh, 10 plus years to design, synthesize, test, and introduce a new polymer material into the uh, into the market. And uh, this is starting by, um, for example, the SMEs are taking some uh, seed molecule. Uh, and then they decompose it and then they generate uh, like millions of possible candidates for the uh, new polymer, which is going to follow some of the properties which are desired by the client or by the um, SMEs. And uh, this is generating like often like a couple of millions of candidates. And then in the end, uh, the SMEs are just selecting maybe 100 or even uh, maybe 1000 uh, polymers, which are going to be synthesized in the lab and then um, tested. So then the problem is that uh, this is taking like uh, usually months. So there is a group of SMEs who are going like uh, manually through each of these uh, polymers and then uh, they select a couple of them that are going to be synthesized. So that the problem is how can we actually speed up uh, this process? And in many times actually this process is uh, completely subjective. First of all, uh, depends on the laboratory. For example, in Almaden we know what kind of um, uh, machines we have and how much money we have and how much time we have. And uh, the bigger, bigger problem is that uh, actually in many cases, the subject matter experts are following their gut feelings. So for example, they could say, okay, I'm kind of sure that this uh, polymer would work, but then another SME would say, okay, I'm quite sure that this polymer would not work because based on some previous experience. So that means that one general model would not work for all the SMEs because um, everybody has different intuitions. Uh, so we developed um, a pipeline for polymer discovery. In the first step is um, it's uh, the brute force uh, generation, which um, is the standard way of uh, generating polymers. And then in the second step, we perform some uh, smart ranking. Uh, and then in the third step, we are um, um, doing uh, smart generation of uh, new polymers uh, from scratch. Uh, so once uh, we have um, uh, uh, the, the brute force uh, generated candidates, we load them into a system which we call Tinder for chemists. Uh, so this can be actually first ranked uh, with some general model, uh, which is following uh, the rules of the laboratory for the costs and uh, for some of the how synthesizable is the polymer. And then uh, the chemists are going to say quickly, uh, they are swiping left and right uh, on the user interface. And they're saying, okay, this is a good candidate, this is a bad candidate. And this is directly fed uh, back into our system. Uh, so to be able to learn from this, uh, what we do first is uh, we convert the chemical structures uh, into uh, machine representable uh, form. So for that we use uh, Morgan fingerprints, uh, which is actually a graph kernel, which is applied on the molecular uh, graph structure. And this is being converted into uh, fingerprint size, which uh, could be like 1K to 4K uh, bits. So Morgan fingerprint is uh, quite similar to the standard uh, subtree kernel, which is uh, spanning from each uh, node uh, into the um, into the graph. And then in each iteration, you're simply increasing uh, the di diameter size. So you go from uh, zero to four, and then until you actually exhaust um, all um, all the uh, all the fragments into the molecule. Then each sub fragment is uh, simply replaced with a unique identifier which is then uh, being hashed into a single uh, fix, fixed length uh, binary uh, representation. So if there is a bit uh, being set, so that means that uh, some particular fragment is actually present in the graph and a zero means that this uh, fragment is not uh, present in the graph. So this is interesting because um, you could uh, use this uh, to calculate similarity between uh, molecules. And uh, also these fingerprints can be used in uh, any uh, as feature vectors for any machine learning. Uh, so then uh, we feed this, uh, this can be fed actually in any uh, kind of data mining algorithm. In this case, we are uh, using a convolutional neural network with one dimensional uh, layers. 
and it's working quite well. We use uh, 100 filters with size of 10, which means that it's going to generate all possible combinations of uh, features uh, of size 10 uh, of 10 bits. Then we use max pooling for uh, feature selection, and this is going to a fully connected softmax layer. And then this is giving us a score, and then this score is used uh, to actually rank uh, the candidates. Uh, this was um, first evaluated on a data set of 300,000 uh, polymers, uh, from which only 15 were accepted by the SME. So we used this and uh, we evaluated in tenfold cross-validation with uh, random oversampling. And actually the um, F-score was quite high, so 92%. That uh, means that uh, if we are able to rank uh, all the candidates, then they would find everything that they're looking for in the first 50. And uh, initially to label all these polymers, it took them a couple of months uh, to a group of uh, five SMEs, I think. Uh, and now the, the system is actually being used in IBM uh, on another data set uh, with uh, additional 100,000 candidates. And they were able to identify 117 synthesizable materials in the first 130 ranked, which is 90% uh, precision. And then it was used on even uh, a more difficult data set with 32 million data sets, uh, candidates. And they were able to identify 66 synthesizable materials in the first 1,000 ranked candidates. And uh, this actually is uh, reducing the time consumption by a factor of 1,000. And here the problem, as I said, is that uh, in this model, we are trying to actually um, integrate the knowledge of uh, each SME um, because this is very, uh, very uh, subjective. And of course, uh, once we know actually that uh, this is working, we are trying now to build uh, polymers from scratch without uh, generating millions of candidates, but uh, just generate a couple of candidates that are actually uh, synthesizable in the lab. So for that, uh, we use first, uh, we are trying to identify what are the desirable features by the SMEs. Uh, for that, we first decompose uh, the molecule. Uh, we built um, a random forest uh, because uh, the deep neural network is very difficult to actually um, explain what is happening and uh, which parts of the, uh, of the molecule are actually important for the users. And then we present uh, the most uh, important features uh, back to the user, uh, which are mapped to the original uh, molecule. So for example, here uh, we can see, okay, these green parts uh, the, the model thinks that these green parts are actually important, or this um, nitrogen molecule uh, atom is important, or maybe this fragment here. Then the user can say, okay, um, actually I agree that this is what, uh, what I also think that it's important, and then they can start uh, a generation process around this uh, fragment. So for that, we again use uh, BioLSTM and uh, generative adversarial um, networks, which are able to lock uh, desired fragments and they can also integrate um, SME-defined constraints, for example, the length of the molecule, uh, the atoms, and uh, the additional uh, properties that are supposed to be used. And then we are generating a sequence of fragments. Then we are using uh, one standard chemical library, which is uh, able to uh, recompile a valid molecular structure. And then again, we use our previous uh, ranking um, system to rank the generated molecules and present them to the SME again. And this is actually working quite well because last week I generated uh, 50 uh, candidates for a new polymer and uh, 30 of them were uh, accepted by the SME for synthesizing. And this is taking now like just 10-15 uh, minutes uh, to be done. So uh, I also wanted to talk about uh, computational creativity, which is the project with uh, McCormick and uh, Simrise. Uh, so McCormick is uh, generating um, uh, new creative spices. And there are already uh, three spices being um, uh, in production. And um, or the Simrace, which is a German company for um, generating new perfumes. And they have one of some of the biggest clients like uh, Hugo Boss uh, Chanel. And they're also now using AI to generate new perfumes. And uh, there was like really a huge success in Brazil, actually, with a couple of new fragrances uh, that were completely generated by AI. So for that, uh, we are using uh, uh, graph embeddings and um, um, and uh, computational creativity, which is coming from uh, all these uh, generative um, uh, neural networks. But yeah, I'm constrained with the time. So, so just as a conclusion, what I would like to say is that um, fully automated AI is the, the future, but uh, currently we live in a human-centered um, AI era. Uh, so what what we are trying to do now is actually to persuade all the subject matter experts to actually work 
quite closely with the AI to be able to transfer this uh, knowledge uh, from the human experts and integrate it in the way, best possible way into the um, AI instead of uh, directly trying to fully automate uh, the AI. And in many cases, actually, uh, the subject matter experts are afraid to work with the AI because they think that they're going to be replaced. For example, with McCormick, we had like troubles to actually come up with uh, any evaluation metrics or goal standards because the SMEs would simply not give any answers. So they would not use the tool or they would actually just uh, press different buttons in the UI just uh, not to give any concrete feedback because they were literally afraid that they're going to lose their jobs, which is not their, the case because we are still trying to learn something and simply to integrate uh, some of their knowledge into the, into the AI. Uh, so this is uh, actually a joint work with uh, my team in uh, IBM Research Almaden. Uh, so Annalisa Gentile and Daniel Gruhl, who are also uh, research uh, staff members. Uh, Linda, who is a um, UI expert, uh, and uh, Chad DeLuca, who is the storage and deployment uh, expert, and uh, Steve Walsh is our uh, manager. Uh, so that will be all. Unfortunately, I had to skip a couple of applications, which are quite interesting, but Great. maybe some other time. Thank you. Just one in, in the personalized knowledge graphs. You had relation extraction and the CNN to do that. What what are you using as training data for that? Are are the knowledge graphs that are manually extracted used as training data for that? Or? So as I said, um, <clears throat> so in the beginning the SMEs are. Um, so the SMEs are like just going through the document, and uh, this is all uh, the the PDF is actually uh, with uh, JavaScript, and they have like additional uh, pop-up windows, which is allowing them to say, okay, there is relation between this drug and that drug. And once we have enough information about um, any of these uh, relations, because there are like 10, 20 relations that they are extracting, then we are in the background building a couple of different models for relation extraction, and then once we see that the model is quite confident for the next uh, documents, then we are just simply proposing these, uh, these labels to, to them. And then they can just uh, press, okay, this is correct, or just reject it, or annotate it a little bit differently. And then this is again fed back into our algorithm. And uh, this approach is uh, just a tweaked um, uh, existing, uh, existing um, approach which is taking the sentence and you have to annotate what are the two entities. So for example, here you have bulb vaccine and next parallel. Uh, this is going to an embedding layer and then no, there no, is some... I understand that. I just wanted to know where the... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But they're always coming from the subject matter experts. Um, so you mentioned that, that the experts didn't uh, seem to trust the AI. How much did you find that that varied across domains? So you started with a very high stakes domain, uh, you know, medical domain with uh, a high level of qualification for the experts, and you ended with uh, much lower stakes you know, spices and perfumes. So how much did uh, willingness to accept the automated uh, extraction or categorization change between these domains? Well, it was uh, quite a big change. So, for example, the doctors, they wouldn't trust the AI, but they're willing to actually contribute, uh, contribute back uh, to the AI and work together. Well, in the spices, it was uh, completely the opposite. They don't trust it. Maybe they trust it, but uh, they are just not willing to, to work at all. In the chemical department, it was uh, quite easy because uh, they, they are all willing uh, to just avoid uh, annotating uh, anything for months or even like uh, reducing their time for 10 times. It's like super useful for them because they are still, but it's a little bit different here because uh, you need the chemists to actually synthesize because we cannot synthesize because you have to operate like uh, 10 machines there, which are, not easy, of course, uh, but in the case, maybe in the spices, because uh, in the end, if uh, the AI is working very well, you can literally replace the person there because uh, once you provide the formula, you don't need some big expertise to actually synthesize that in, into the spices because, again, that you can use additional machines for that. But in the chemical domain, it was not that the part because they know that they are irreplaceable currently. And in the medical domain, it's a bit different because uh, the doctors, of course, they have like a lot of freedom. So, and also because we are using this for understanding data centers, and then also it was quite difficult to work with the subject matter experts. And then in the end, uh, we are not working with them, but we work with uh, some of the managers of the of the clients who can actually now do the the work of uh, a group of subject matter experts. It sounds like you're saying that very selfish motivations determine whether or not individuals. 
actually yes. trust this. Yes, for example, in the data centers, uh, currently the state of the art is like extracting all the logs from all the servers in Excel sheet, and then somebody like secretly going through this Excel sheet, not uh, sharing with anybody, just uh, to, to keep it like as a secret, not to learn anything from it. One last question. Yeah, I mean, just to follow on, did you, did you actually do any formal analysis on your human experts, figure out what their, you know, motivations were? and? skill levels and all sorts of that stuff, or is this just sort of a series of, of assumptions from that of facts that you... So, for example, all these subject matter experts, they are already working there for years. So they are like, uh, for example, in the perfumes and in the McCormick, they all have experienced more than 10 years. Because to become product developer, you need to have uh, 10 years of uh, training and expertise. And also to be a medical doctor, of course, that's taking even more. So they're all like high level experts who are highly, highly paid. And, uh, but we didn't do any formal analysis in the end, of course. Yeah, I think we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.